Today's presentation is Truth, Objectivity, and Doubt. In late 19th century U.S. neurological discourse regarding phantom limb pain. The presenter is Daniel Goldberg, JD, PhD, Assistant Professor in Bioethics and Interdisciplinary Studies at the Brody School of Medicine, and he's been at ECU for about four years. Here is Daniel Goldberg to speak on truth, objectivity, and doubt in late 19th century U.S. neurological discourse regarding phantom limb pain. Thank you, uh, Melissa. Everyone hear me okay? Yeah? Um, uh, also, thanks um, to Dale Sauter and Joyner Library for allowing us to do this over here. Um, I'm based on the dark side, as I like to call it, the Galactic Empire. Um, the Division of Health Sciences campus, as I like to joke, when I'm, of course, when I'm um, over there, I say that this is the dark side, of course, right? So, because um, you have to know your audience. So, but, but I, I like, I, I do come to um, the side of campus quite a bit for a couple of reasons, and so I thought it would be nice to, to sort of do this over here. Um, but thanks to Joyner Library and Dale Sauter for making that possible. Thanks, special thanks also to um, Ann Anderson at the Country Doctor Museum for bringing these artifacts. Um, those of you probably walked in maybe didn't see what was going on out there, but I'm gonna reference some of the pieces that are in this collection out there, and we'll talk a little bit about what's on the table here. Uh, on your way out, maybe take a look at them uh, and, and, and think a little bit about um, um, some of the things that I'm, I'm sort of gonna be talking about today because they, they fit in very well. So thanks, and I really appreciate it, okay? So um, this is quite a handful of a title, right? I realize that as Melissa was forced to struggle through it twice, so I probably should have come up with something better, but this is, this is what I had. So um, this is what uh, I'll, you guys can hold me accountable for by the end of today. So to describe the rise of somaticism in changing models of Western medicine in the 19th century, you probably don't know what somaticism is, that's okay, <laughs> that's the goal. Um, to describe a 19th century understandings of pain without lesion among leading Anglo-American neurologists, and why neurologists I'll talk a little bit about. And then actually the third point is to explain the relevance of 19th century understandings of pain without lesion for contemporary pain management. So we'll talk, I'll talk a little bit about the third one in particular today. So I'm gonna start at the present as opposed to starting at the past. I'm sure the historians in the room are wincing, okay? But why, why? Um, so first of all, it's generally not disputed that the inequitable undertreatment of pain is a major population health problem. The Institute of Medicine in 2011 estimated that probably about 116 million Americans experience chronic pain. That's an underestimate because it doesn't include adolescents or children because we don't have good population prevalence estimates for them. So if we consider pain as an independent disease, which most pain medicine people are in agreement that we probably should, um, is by far the most prevalent illness experience in the United States, way, way more than anything else. You can combine cancer, heart disease, diabetes, asthma, you still don't get to that number, basically. It's probably, we don't have good global estimates, but it's a huge global problem, too. Probably as many as one in 10 adults experience pain all over the world. So uh, it's, also inequitably, it's also inequitably treated. Some groups of people are more likely to get adequate treatment of pain for others. So uh, I'm not trying to slam on individual providers, okay? A lot of individual providers may do, a, they may and they can't, and they absolutely do a, a terrific job. But in the aggregate, and I work a lot on public and population health, so I think in terms of groups, in the aggregate, it's very difficult to deny the scope of the problem. We have a real big problem here. Um, so when I say, when we talk about pain, and I actually, you can see the artifact, it's right out there in the case. One of the first things everybody wants to talk about is opium. Right, everybody wants to talk about drugs, okay? So just to give you guys a heads up, I'm not gonna be talking much about that today, and just to give you guys a heads up on why I do, my sort of views on pain is that there are really two public health problems. There are a lot more than two, but there's two that I'm talking about, right? The one is the safe and effective use of opioid analgesics, and that is, that is a public health problem. There is no doubt that that's a public health problem. Uh, the second problem is the undertreatment of pain. Uh, for a very long time, we have proceeded as if these are the same problem. And part of my work, not my history work so much, but my contemporary work on pain, pain is devoted towards sort of suggesting, I don't really think so, that these are really related but distinct problems. And that we're not really gonna resolve our problems in undertreating pain by focusing solely on opioids, okay? So um, I'm not gonna be talking much about that today, although usually when I talk about the history of pain, I get questions on that, okay? So if you have questions about that, we can talk about that in the uh, um, in in the um, in the Q and A, but again, I, I think it's important to note that that's really what people think about when they think about pain, and that's reflected in the exhibit case, right? I mean, we have the opium there, right? So so, uh, and I don't want to deny that it's relevant to pain. It's just I, I don't think it's sort of um, the key. So uh, my approach to sort of thinking about these things in context of history is um, there's this view of history that it's sort of linear. History was then, and now is now. 
right? And I tend to um, reject that, right? So I, I think history really didn't happen back then. The world we live in every day um, looks the way it does because of things that happened in the past. If different things had happened in different ways, the world we're living in today would look very different and the world we're living in tomorrow would look very different, right? And so that's part of my approach to thinking about history um, is, that, is that it shapes what we're doing today as well as what we could be doing in the future. Uh, a fancy term for that people will often use is path dependency, right? I mean, the, the sort of where we are now is heavily path dependent. Okay, so that's sort of my approach. And you'll see as I go through this, I'm actually a historian of ideas. I'm interested in the way that ideas about pain without lesion, and I'll say what that is, I promise, okay, that it uh, influenced how people regarded pain, uh, both then and now. That's really what I'm interested in. So the use of ideas to shape material history. So um, my experience has been teaching these things is that people seem to like cases. So let's do some cases, okay? So this is case 49. This is how it's numbered. It comes from a man named John Carsley Mitchell. John Carsley Mitchell is the son of a man named Silas Ware Mitchell. Has anybody ever heard of Silas Ware Mitchell in the audience? There's some students here from one of my classes. They've all heard of Silas Ware Mitchell, okay? Because we talk about Ware Mitchell. So Silas Ware Mitchell is actually, and we'll talk about Ware Mitchell as well. Uh, Silas Ware Mitchell is one of the, the founders of the American field of neurology. He is one of the, the progenitors of neuro American neurology. Um, he was intensely interested in pain his whole life. He was an assistant army surgeon during the Civil War, and he rounded at, there were 24 army hospitals in Philadelphia that we know about. There were probably others that weren't very well documented. Um, but he rounded in most of them, and he encountered lots of people, lots of soldiers who were experiencing pain, and lots of soldiers who were experiencing phantom limb pain, which is really sort of the subject of this talk. So. What's really interesting is that most people who know who are interested in the history of pain or interested in the history of neurology uh, or just interested in Ware Mitchell because he was uh, actually, he, the second half of his career he became a literatus. He was basically a tra traveling essayist. He would give, um, he was a poet and a writer and he would give talks and people paid him money for it. He didn't do much clinical practice after about 1900, right? So what's really interesting is that most people know about Ware Mitchell's interest in phantom limb pain, but what most people don't know is that he actually passed that interest onto his son. And this is his son. This is John Carsley Mitchell. Um, there's actually John Carsley Mitchell Sr., who was Ware Mitchell's father, but this is Junior. So this is his son. And he wrote this important treatise, and I'll talk quite a bit about this treatise in, in, this, in this talk, called Remote Consequences of Injuries of Nerves in Their Treatment. The title actually is important. So here's case 49. It's JD. JD is a 53-year-old male. He was wounded in the right forearm two inches below the elbow in the 1862 Peninsular Campaign. Now, I'm going to stop right here because usually when I give this talk, people get very excited about Civil War medicine. Okay, so I have to sort of stop and let everybody know that I am not a Civil War historian. And then I usually say it again, I am not a Civil War historian. And then usually I say it a third time, but I'll let you guys off the hook, okay? So, so I don't know a whole lot about Civil War medicine, okay? But, but this, is, this is where where Mitchell's interest really started, and it's sort of an important part of the story, okay? But if you guys in the Q&A start asking me questions about Civil War medicine, I'm probably not going to be able to answer you, okay? Okay? Uh, even though I know it's, a, it's sort of very interesting for a lot of people, right? So... Um, he had separating and necrotic bone for about 20 years. This was unfortunately not uncommon injury from what's called a mini A ball. And this is also, there's also some information about mini A balls uh, listed in, in the artifacts out there right next to the amputation kit. As we will see in a moment, this is not coincidental, okay? Mini A balls were the major type of um, rifle shot that were actually used in the Civil War. Um, I think it was French in origin. I think that's where the name comes from. They, they caused terrible injuries because they exploded upon impact. Um, so really just terrible kinds of, of especially bone injuries, right? I mean, the really limbs were, were, were blown off constantly. There were a lot of amputations in the Civil War. And so oftentimes these wounds would, would separate. There would be necrotic bone. There would be fragments coming out for 20 years. One of the things I actually study is uh, pension claims from veterans as well. You really start to see these injuries quite commonly, okay? So it was amputated in 1886. So note that there's a sort of a 20, you know, 20 plus year delay between when he actually experienced the injury and when it was amputated. So Hard to imagine what, what he might have been going through during that time. This is the clinical description. Uh, burning in the lost arm and where the injury existed, there is a sensation as of the crawling of worms over the part. Okay, so this is a phantom limb sensation, right? So why phantom limb pain? What am I interested in about phantom limb pain, right? So I, I think it's interesting and significant for a variety of different reasons. So phantom limb pain was a conundrum where Mitchell thought it was a conundrum and he passed that interest in the conundrum onto his son, apparently, because his son also thought it was a conundrum. So why is it a conundrum? What was important about it? Well, so you have in the 19th century these, these, these dramatically changing models of medicine. Medicine really changes in and around the year 1800. I mean, it's sort of ridiculous to pinpoint it to a specific year, right? It's more gradual than that, but it really does change pretty dramatically in the 19th century. These changes are well entrenched, increasingly well entrenched. They're not 
completely solid, but they're increasingly well entrenched by the 1890s. These changes are a piece of a larger puzzle of what I call pain without lesion, and I'll tell you what that is in a minute. So pain without lesion is actually a term of art. Um, it's a term that's developed by historians of pain. The problem is that we would call something chronic pain today, but that term didn't come around until the 1960s. So if we start talking about chronic pain in the 19th century, nobody knows what we're talking about, all right? We want to avoid anachronisms. Um, and the part of the problem is that disease entities, what they would call nosology, which is the way that diseases were categorized in the 19th century, was very, very fluid, right? And so what could mean pain? A whole bunch of different things. There's 20, 25, 30 different terms that, that physicians and health providers, healers could use to describe pain. Um, most of the people who study this use the umbrella term pain without lesion, and I'll tell you why that's important in a minute. But um, these changes in 19th century medical culture, I think they can really be come down to what I call these twin sons. The first is an emphasis on pathological anatomy. Uh, anatomy is not new, it's ancient. Right? I mean, Galen was interested in anatomy, right? Uh, but, but what really happens in the 19th century is that pathological anatomy actually comes to define what it means to be a physician. This is what happens, right? But it's not just enough to find these lesions, this pathological anatomy. We also have to be able to correlate it with the illness complaint, right? Uh, when was the illness complaint? Let's see if I can catch you guys on your toes. Well, well yeah, so the patient's probably dead. If we're doing pathological anatomy, it's probably a post-mortem. So it's the illness complaint that the patient had when they were still alive, basically, okay, is what I'm getting at, right? So that at least until we get x-rays, right, uh, which really hard to look at pathological anatomy, although they tried. There are lots of different ways they tried. Um, but we, we look for the lesions, the dysmorphologies, the structural problems, okay? And lesion was a term that they would use in the 19th century. That's why I use that term. It's a wonderfully expansive term. It can refer to all different kinds of things, okay? But they would look for these lesions that they could correlate with illness complaints, right? So. Um, Pain without lesion is a problem because there's no lesion, right? How are you going to, in this sort of model, these changing models of medicine, which is actually called, it came to be called then and now the anatomoclinical method. It's still the major way in which medicine is taught today, uh, in the US certainly and in most of the West, right? So, so it, it's called the anatomo, anatomoclinical method, the clinicopathologic method, but this method is still sort of very strongly entrenched today in models of Western medicine, right? And so the issue is, well, pain without lesion becomes a problem because if we can't find the dysmorphology, if we can't find the lesion or the problem, then how are we going to be able to correlate it with the illness complaint, right? We really don't know what they would use this term, the seat of the diseases, S-E-A-T, okay? So with no discrete material pathology, how could pain even exist? So leading American neurologists actually denied that this was possible. And, I'll, and, and what do I mean by that? Well, so, so I'll back up a couple steps. First of all, why am I focusing on neurologists? Neurology as a specialty really begins to take hold right about this time, mid to late 19th century, where Mitchell was involved. Um, this is another man who was heavily involved. His name is William Hammond. William Hammond was actually, actually the Surgeon General of the Federal Army uh, during the Civil War. So he was basically where Mitchell's boss. He was where Mitchell's friend, sort of. Um, they had some professional disagreements, and he uh, and and he was uh, a neurologist as well. And so he, in this treatise, spinal irritation, which is one of those code words for pain without lesion, basically, right? And this uh, eighteen, I think it's eighteen seventy six, might be eighteen eighties. I can't read that. Uh, in this in this treatise um, on pain without lesion, he basically says. Um, it's not, it, it, there's basically no such thing as pain without lesion. There is only pain with lesions that we can find and pain with lesions that we cannot find. But there is no such thing as pain without a lesion. That doesn't exist. All pains have lesions. It's just a question of where are they. And, and I want to be careful about it here because this doesn't mean that people like William Hammond or where Mitchell actually denied or invalidated their patient's pain. We actually don't have a lot of good evidence that they did so, at least with regard to their socially privileged patients. Less socially privileged patients is a different question. We'll talk a little bit about that, okay? But they probably didn't do that. They probably didn't trivialize or invalidate their patient's pain, or at least if they did, we don't have a lot of evidence of it, okay? So they didn't deny that their patient's experiences of pain. They denied that it was possible that their patients could be experiencing pain without lesion. The lesion is there. It's just a question of can we find it or not, right? So Rosalind Ray, who's a historian of pain, she has this great quote, at the dawn of the 19th century, physicians were looking for a pure sign which would remove the ambiguities inherent in symptoms. They wished to find a sign, the meaning of which would be as certain as that provided by the lesion found at dissection. And what's really interesting is I've given versions of this talk actually for pain clinicians and pain providers, and they look at that and I ask them, is this history or not? Because this says at the dawn of the 19th century, but if you take out that first part, 
they generally, in my experience, they tend to affirm that that could pretty much describe one of the some of the major what people really want with regard to pain uh, in the present as well, right? To find a sign as certain as the lesion found at dissection. Okay, so this is really what they were looking for. This was what was so important in a 19th century context, but what is old is new and vice versa. Okay, it's also pretty important today, I think, and, and pain providers, I think, will generally affirm that, right? So. Um, sort of exploring this idea a little bit more. So, so the lesion has to exist. How can we find the lesion? How can we attribute the lesion? Well, the title of John Carsley Mitchell's text um, is, is, is actually called Remote Consequences of the Injuries of Nerves and Their Treatment. So the idea of remote consequences becomes pretty important. What do I mean by remote consequences? Well, it can mean a couple different things. JD was injured in 1862, and then he had his amputation in 1886. So that is literally a remote consequence, right? But it's also remote in terms of the geography of the body. So what do I mean by that, right? Well, so there's a guy's name is Benjamin Brody. Benjamin Brody was a British surgeon. Very important. He operated, no pun intended. <laughs> Most sorry about that, guys. Mostly in the first half of the uh, that's a terrible pun. Mostly in the first half of the 19th century, um, and he basically said there's this very very famous case where he basically tracked this woman who had been com complaining of an extreme pain in her foot, uh, a persistent pain every day for years, unremitting pain, severe pain, and he looked all over her body, did all sorts of examinations, and then he said he basically found it, uh, um, a, a, a sort of a, a very trivial lesion in sort of her pinky finger, and he said that's it, that must be it. Okay, so that's a remote consequence, right? That's taken the idea of referred pain to an extreme, right? The idea that any kind of pain, if we can't find a lesion to it, can be explained by a lesion that we can locate somewhere in the geography of the body. That is literally a remote consequence, okay? Charcot, Charcot, who's considered also one of the sort of the, the fathers of neurology, Charcot is obviously French, not American, okay? Um, but he discusses it. He's, he's even got a term for it, right? He calls it, he calls it a, a dynamic or a functional lesion. A dynamic or functional lesion is one that must be there, but that we can't find. That's literally what a dynamic or functional lesion is, okay? So these, this idea of remote consequences. So let's go back to case uh, 49, and let's look at Carsley Mitchell's comments. He says, it is remarkable that there is not in this case any evidence of the presence of a neuritis. The possibility of a neuritis ascending from the nerve in the stump and affecting the spinal cord is to be considered. But the most careful examination does not indicate any such trouble. The difficulty has a more obscure origin. Okay, And so I think what you can really get in this quote is what I call sort of somaticism. Somaticism is the idea that whatever kind of illness complaint the patient is experiencing has to be explained in terms of these lesions in the body. Soma, right, from the Greek word for body. Soma come from soma mean body, I think? Okay, right. My Greek is not very good, right? So, um, but that's where the sort of phrase come from. There's other phrases that historians will use to describe the same kind of idea, but, but that's it. So look at this in context of JD. He experiences pain, other health problems. Carsley Mitchell attempts to understand his problems in terms of somaticism. So he's got an illness complaint. He's experiencing pain. The first thing we do is we look for the nerve in the stump. We look for a lesion that's located very close to the illness complaint that the patient is experiencing, okay? So it's not there, uh, and then we go up. It ascends from the nerve, right? We keep looking for these kinds of material structures that we can use to explain the patient's illness complaint, but we can't find them. The difficulty has a more obscure origin, right? So we're looking for these pathologies that we can clinically or correlate with the illness complaints, okay? So that's the first case. The second case, to sort of continue to talk about these things, it comes from our friend Ware Mitchell, right? Um, so uh, Ware Mitchell, again, rounded. He had a lifelong interest in pain. He's the one who coined the phrase neuralgia for this kind of burning pain. People actually still use it today. And that was actually Ware Mitchell's um, uh, phrase. What, what's really sort of interesting and I think a little bit gruesome, and I've, I've, I've looked quite a bit at the, the Ware Mitchell papers, which are in the College of Physicians of Philadelphia, and I've spoken with the, the director of the, the History Museum there, and he said that it's pretty well known, it's documented in Ware Mitchell's sort of clinical records, what he was doing during the war, that he was experimenting with galvanism and ferritism which was quite common for the time, but that meant that he would be sort of, these soldiers were experiencing pain and sort, sorts of other problems, and then he'd be hooking them up to electricity machines and running electric currents through their stumps and things like that, and nobody really know what they would do. So there's an electric machine out there, by the way, just in case you guys want to go take a look at that, okay? So another part of, of where Mitchell's sort of practice and interest, and you can see them, I've seen the clinical records, he talks about applying ferratic currents constantly, probably well up through the 1870s. Okay, so this uh, case, this next case, we're gonna look at 46, and we're sort of jumping around in chronology, which is not a good habit, but that's that's sort of how I set this up. Okay, so. Um, he, he, this is a, a, one of his Civil War patients. Uh, he wrote about this in, he published a treatise immediately after the Civil War, and then this is a revised and expanded version of it that he published in 1872. So this is a soldier who had his leg crushed, 
We'll talk about prosthetics in a little bit, okay? Uh, in a railway accident in 1862, uh, amputation at the junction of the lower and middle third, intense neuralgia. So this patient was experiencing intense pain, right? It's hard to find the voices of patients in a lot of these things. Um, there's, there's a little bit, but not much in the clinical records, okay? Um, so then the stump was amputated in 1863, okay? Uh, in 1864, there was another amputation. Okay, two nerves were enlarged and engorged. The pain continued, and it was intolerable. Okay, so this starts in 1862. There's already two amputations. We're going to keep going. We're going to see what's happening here. Okay, uh, June 1st, 1864. Doctor Knott, who is is fairly well known in his own own regard, removed one inch of the trunk of the sciatic nerve and three inches of the popliteal and the perineal nerves. You think it helped? What do you think is going to happen next? May 1865, Dr. Knott justly, justly is the editorial comment inserted by Ware Mitchell. Dr. Knott justly admits that he had, quote, no very good physiological reasons for so doing, dissected out the two large nerve trunks completely down to the extremity of the stump. Right now, this looks like we're laughing at poor Dr. Knott. Right? But again, if we think about models of medicine in 1865, it actually, it's not, it's not quite as crazy as it sounds. Now, you know, the idea, again, that Dr. Knott has is there has to be a lesion somewhere in there. I'm going to keep excising these nerves because I know this, this poor guy is in intense pain and I want to help him. And here's how I'm going to do it. I'm going to keep taking out these material structures in the body. Uh, where Mitchell even says, well, you don't really have any good reason for doing so. Right? And this is not retrospective diagnosis. We're not sitting here in 2013 and judging him. Where Mitchell is sitting there and saying, well, there's probably not a good reason to think that there's a lesion there. But the, 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 you know, Dr. Knott's clinical reasoning is still quite sound. So dissected out these two large nerve trunks. Do you think it worked? Naturally. No relief ensued. And in despair, the thigh was removed four inches above the knee, where the sciatic nerve was seen to be engorged and double its normal size. So you see what's going on. The amputations are going higher and higher and higher up the leg. And now there's some excitement in the clinical description because, again, there's now a material structure involved. The sciatic nerve is engorged and double its normal size. Did it work? No, it didn't. The neuralgia continued. Okay? And again, when I talk about this case, which I've discussed with pain providers, well, I, uh, pain providers, I ask them if this sounds familiar. Right? Because if you know anything about treatment for chronic pain today, this is a lot of times what happens, right? You try various things and they work for a little while and then they don't work. And, and again, so sort of what is old is new, okay? So the neuralgia continues. In August of 1865, Dr. Knott accepted, that's their word, the sciatic nerve at the point of exit, removing 1.25 inches. How much of his leg does poor 46 have left here, okay? The pain returned the next day. So here's how we see somaticism. The seat of the intense pain that this poor soldier was experiencing, this poor veteran was experiencing, had to be in the material lesion itself, right? This is what Dr. Knott is thinking. It had to be somewhere there, right? And so if each of these, if each of these resections isn't working, we're just gonna go up, 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 up the leg, okay? And eventually what happens is, basically, I've asked some of my medical students about this, basically what happens is, I think the, ampu the original amputation was at the lower third, and basically the guy ends up without a leg. Literally, I mean, the leg is basically being completely amputated from the bottom all the way to the top in an effort to help this guy, okay? So this also refers to this idea of localization. So localization is an extremely important sort of component of somaticism. It was particularly powerful among neurologists, okay? And it was the idea that any kind of illness complaint is localizable, right? We can localize it to a particular area of the body where we can find a lesion, right? So phrenology, what's phrenology? You guys know what phrenology is, right? Right. Yeah, so phrenology is actually an outgrowth of, of the, the sort of significance of localization, the significance of cerebral localization, the idea that parts of our personalities are, right, can be, are, are attributable to certain actual uh, areas of our brain. But in all of localization, you see this emphasis, again, on the material structure, on the lesions, right, on these parts of the body, in the body, right? As such, amputation and resection is actually appropriate treatment, right? It, it's not cl clinically, it makes, makes sense, sort of, right? I mean, it makes sense in, in, in context of the time. Uh, but it provided virtually no relief. Uh, and in fact, it prompted further surgeries. And this is all pretty, again, common stuff if you look at contemporary chronic, train pe contemporary chronic pain treatments, or at least we ask people who are experiencing chronic pain what they're going through. This is the kind of thing that they report very often, right? Sort of this constant go around, back and forth, some relief, then they return, right? Um, 
So here's where my, we get to my favorite part of case 46, okay? So this has been going on for several years, and Dr. Knott's been trying to help this poor guy, and it's not working. It's not working, right? He keeps doing all these resections, these amputations. This poor guy's had his, comp his leg completely amputated, but it's not working. So what does Dr. Knott say at the end? He believes that his patient was really much eased by this final procedure, but that his craving for opium caused him to malinger. Right? So there's opium again, right? You see? So, so opium comes back. So, um, so we'll say some things now. We'll switch a little bit. We'll talk a little bit about malingering. So, so, so what's really interesting about this is, is think about the frustration that Dr. Knott is experiencing and where Mitchell is recounting the story as well, right? I mean, that he's trying to help him as best he can. He's going up and up and up the leg, trying to find the material lesion, can't find it. And at the end, even when his poor patient is still experiencing pain, there's disbelief. There's this belief. He, he really says, I just can't believe that this isn't working anymore. I've removed the entire structure. There is no more material structure. It's not there anymore, right? Which is a common experience for people who, who suffer phantom limb pain. I mean, that's one of the problems of phantom limb pain. How can you have a lesion in a limb that doesn't exist? It's not there anymore, so where is the lesion? Okay, so that's one of the problems and the conundrums. I think one of the reasons why Ware Mitchell and his son were so interested in it. So there's this accusation of malingering. So malingering, what what... What does malingering mean to you guys when I say malingering? What do you guys think it is? Saying you, you don't feel well when you actually do. Right? Yeah? Okay, that's good. So malingering. Malingering is sort of, I mean, it's an old concern, right? People have been concerned about feigned illness for thousands of years. I mean, there's, there's medieval, there's, <coughs> we can document it in medieval medicine as well. Um, but, but it takes on particular importance right at about this time. And this is where it starts to get interesting in the, 18th, uh, in the 19th century and then the early 20th century. And it's really, um, 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 it becomes most prominent, it starts most prominently in a martial context. Uh, during the Civil War, uh, especially towards the end of the Civil War, people really didn't want to be involved with the Civil War anymore. The soldiers had basically had enough. Many of them had died, of course, but many of the ones who were there didn't want to be there anymore uh, for quite understandable reasons on both sides. And so the detection of malingerers became very important. We can see this. Nobody actually knows what this is. I've actually asked the Welcome Library if they can tell me how this works. Nobody really knows. Um, it looks like some kind of test type apparatus that they used for the detection of malingerers in World War I in 1910 and 1920. Um, Amputation and phantom limb pain is generally a big problem in, in modern military conflicts in general. It was a huge problem in World War I, in fact, um, and was telling me that this is probably, this was probably, this prosthetic limb was probably dated to about World War I. So it would be contemporaneous with this particular image. So, so but that's the thing where, I, sort of to return to this case, what happens is we can't find the lesion. The patient continues to complain of pain and it becomes so difficult that eventually the clinician starts to doubt the patient's pain experience. Starts to say, well, he must be after the opium, right? He must be malingering, okay? So these concerns are, are sort of, they're, they're sort of old. But what's really interesting is you can actually start to see anxieties about malingering change over the course of the 19th century, right? They sort of flow from concerns over soldiers and slaves. There's actually, a, there was a there's um, some great work by a historian of medicine named Charlotte Fett who's written about the use of feigned illness in the plantation slave economy, which is really, really interesting, right? But it changes, it sort of transmutes from just the bodies of soldiers and slaves, and now there starts to be concern about malingering among the, bourgeois, the bourgeoisie, right? So white workers, women especially, were often accused of malingering. Or there was a lot of concerns about malingering, right? And uh, where Mitchell could probably fairly be accused of being a misogynist, to be honest with you, even by the standards of his own time. I'm not judging him retrospectively, okay? I mean, people of his own time thought he was misogynist, okay? So, and there's enough evidence of that, probably, to, to not be tarnishing his name by, by sort of saying that, okay? So, um, in the absence of the material lesion, here's the idea, and we saw this, okay, with case 46, the pain becomes doubtful. So this is an engram. Engrams are not proof of anything, okay? So, so, so bear that, but I still think it's interesting to look at, okay? It's not proof of anything, but, so what am I looking at? I'm looking at sort of, at Google engrams look at how often the term that you're searching for is sort of appears in the Google index, which is when we're talking about the 19th century, it's pretty comprehensive, because 19th century texts are pretty much all out of copyright. It's all public domain, so Google's index is pretty, pretty good. It's Google, right? Uh, and you can start to see, over the course of the 19th century, even while the absolute, right, the absolute prevalence of the term is still not very high, you can start to see a pretty dramatic relative increase once we get into sort of 1840 to 1880. Okay, so this is malingering in the 19th century. Um, in the 20th century, there's a flat line between 1900 and 1910. I have no idea why that would be there. It shouldn't be. 
I would predict that it would be higher, but I'm wrong, okay? Uh, but then you start to see a dramatic sort of, again, a dramatic relative increase between 1910 and 1920. That is exactly what you would find. A lot of really important pamphlets on malingering are starting to be produced right at about this time. And so it's not coincidental. You saw that test type apparatus, right? That's also been used to detect malingerers in World War I. Anxieties over malingering, about truth telling, about deception in the context of pain and these kinds of illness complaints uh, really starts to take hold in the late 19th and the early 20th century. Century. And pain, this was well, I mean, you can find this in Civil War medical texts. Pain was the number one bugaboo. The military surgeons were not happy about pain. They said you can always feign pain, you can always feign rheumatism, right? And, and all the other terms that they would use for it, right? So, what does this have to do for the present? Because I promised I was going to tell you something about my sort of view on what this has to do with the present, right? So, chronic pain still today belongs to a family of what anthropologists call contested illnesses, right? These are illnesses that um, oftentimes seem to promote skepticism and doubt. Why they do is a, a, an interesting question, right? So, Elaine Scarry, who's, a, um, who's a, a literature scholar and sort of one of the godmothers of pain studies in general, she says that pain is among the most privately certain and the publicly doubted sensations, right? At the same time, right? You know when you experience pain and yet it seems to be publicly doubted a lot more than other kinds of experiences we can have. And one of the examples I often use is nausea. We don't really publicly doubt it when people are experiencing nausea. I mean, I guess we could, but we tend not to. But pain is different. Patients, uh, people who, and even people who aren't actually under actual clinical care of any kind, patients consistently report experiencing skepticism and doubt, uh, and not just from providers. There is probably 18 to 20 different definitions of chronic pain. It's slippery, right? Uh, Emily Dickinson has a famous poem where she says that pain has an element of blank. So you can see this. This is Partly, I think, at least what the speaker's talking about. Most of these definitions em emphasize the absence of organic lesions or tissue damage. Pain that persists when it shouldn't is how I've often heard chronic pain described, right? There was an injury, it's healed, there's no actual lesion, there's no structural problem that we can see, and yet the patient is still reporting significant amounts of pain, okay? This is a problem for somaticism. This is a problem for thinking about how we objectify disease, which I'm not saying that somaticism is a bad thing. I'm just saying that it, can hand, it handles a lot of illness complaints very, very well. Uh, it handles some less well, okay? And I think pain is one of the ones it handles less well, and there are some historical reasons why that would be the case, right? So here's my joke. <laughs> that's it. That's pretty much the joke of the day, okay? If you don't laugh, that's all I've got, right? So um, the proof is in the pudding. What do I mean by that? Well, um, so... Partly what I'm interested in is if there's any credence to sort of what I'm suggesting as a historical narrative, we should be able to find that, right, if I'm arguing that it has relevance for contemporary issues of pain, we should be able to find that in stories about pain. We should be able to talk to pain sufferers and find out what they think and why they think it and how they're being regarded and how, what are the attitudes, practices, and beliefs that are being applied towards their pain. And so really we're talking about ethnographies of pain. And when we look at ethnographies of chronic pain sufferers, and there are a lot of them, the prediction is they should, they should should show somaticism, if there's any credence to what I'm suggesting, and fortunately they do, right? They do show somaticism. So the best example I often give, and, I, and this is one of my favorite examples, is medical imaging for chronic low back pain. Now, I like this example just because I happen to be interested in it. That's really why I use it. There's probably other ones, okay? So medical imaging for chronic low back pain, very high utilization. We do a lot of medical imaging uh, in this country, even uh, quite a bit more relative to the rest of the industrialized world, okay? We use a lot of it, especially for chronic low back pain, and the problem is that Cat's out of the bag, in case you guys didn't know. Probably doesn't work very well, okay? We've looked real hard, right? And I'm not a clinician, but I can read epidemiology, and I don't think there's a lot of dispute on this. There is not a lot of very good evidence of benefits uh, for the use of medical imaging for chronic nonspecific low back pain. We don't find it, and we've looked, okay? Doesn't mean it isn't there, but it's increasingly unlikely, okay? So one of the questions then we might have is, well, if, why do we use it so much? Right? That's one of the questions I'm interested in. If we don't have really good evidence of benefit, why do we use it? And so there's a lot of sort of possible answers to this, right? Well, most people say we use things. We want to know how much we use something. It's about supply and demand, right? And obviously, I'm no economist, okay? But so one of the interesting things um, is when you look at this, the supply of medical technologies in general is the single largest determinant in how much we use this, right? So I give this example all the time. The single largest determinant of hospitalization is beds. Guess what we do if we have beds? We put people in them, 
Okay, that's what happens. And this goes, this is an old story. This has been documented for about the last 50 years. This is generally overwhelmingly true. Okay, generally, if we have medical technologies, if we have healthcare technologies, we tend to use them, especially when they're expensive, like imaging devices, right? Those can run a million dollars. So the only way you're gonna get a good return on investment if you're a clinic is to use it. That's the only way it's gonna happen, okay? And in fact, so here, when you look at this statistic, exactly what you find, um, as I sort of like to joke with a lot of my students, we loves us some technology in the US. It's actually our precious is how I refer to it, okay? for you Lord of the Rings fans, okay? But, but what's interesting is that even though we use a lot of technology in general, growth in the use of imaging is actually more even relative to the general growth in the use of technology. So even while we're generally using a lot of technology, we're using even more medical imaging, right? So there's something that's going on with the imaging. And in fact, this, this man named Richard Deo, He's a primary care physician in Oregon who treats a lot of pain patients. He actually refers to it as idolatry. That's his term. We worship at the altar of medical imaging. This is what he says. I'm not saying this, okay? This is what he says. So, um, and in fact, when we look at it, exactly what we find, right? An increase in imaging units pretty much directly leads to an increase in imaging, right? Each MRI unit produces 410 more users. Users is a technical health services research term. It basically just means more procedures, okay? Each CT unit, 650 more users, right? When they look at physicians who own imaging centers and they look at the referral rates, Guess what they find, okay? Those have much, much higher utilization than uh, places where there is different ownership of the units, okay? So simple story, right? Supply drives use. I don't think so. I don't think so, okay? I think it's demand too. Who's demanding medical imaging? Patients, Patients are demanding medical imaging. Patients want medical imaging. Patients who are experiencing chronic pain want medical imaging, and that's something that's very, very clear. Right? There's very little doubt about that. Um, patients lack the luxury of denying their own pain, but we have very good evidence that chronic pain sufferers in particular, they can and they do deny the legitimacy of the pain they experience. They want that, they want to see the lesions. And that's part of the point, this way of understanding pain, these idea of lesions, it's not just a medical discourse, right? It is a discourse about ways of understanding the body, ways of understanding pain, ways of understanding health and illness. It's very, very, very powerful, okay? Um, in addition, we know that, believe it or not, most people think this is sort of almost impossible, but it's actually quite common, self-stigma. People can actually stigmatize themselves, um, and, and it's actually quite common with pain patients, right? So again, they do not have the luxury of denying the existence of their pain, but they can and do the, deny the legitimacy of it. And there's probably an idea, at least the patients report this in the ethnographies, that the medical imaging is a way of giving them proof. It gives them the proof, and of course then they can take it to others who doubt them as well, but it's a way of validating their own pain experiences, okay? so. In context of pain stigma, it's relatively common as best we can tell. We don't have good estimates for the prevalence of stigma. We don't have good population estimates, right? But the available qualitative evidence uh, tells us that it's pretty common. It seems pretty common. A lot of patients report experiencing it. Uh, there's probably many reasons, but I think somaticism has to be numbered among them, right? So go back to Dr. Knott. He can't find the lesion. He can't find the lesion even though he basically takes off the poor guy's entire leg. He amputates the entire leg. At the end, he is reduced to doubt. Okay, and I think, I think that those attitudes, practices, beliefs are relevant, right? So C. Stratton Hill, who is a um, retired pain physician who's been advocating for better pain management since I was in diapers, uh, and I can say that because I'm friends with him and I have he actually said that in his presence and he didn't throw something at me, okay? So um, um, he actually said in 1995 that attitudes about pain are systematically transferred from one generation of providers to the next, okay? Uh, and so I think that I, I, I want to sort of document what he's what he's suggesting okay so this is the example of Clio Clio is the muse of history okay Clio lives Clio in the clinic um, and that's really it I'm sort of gonna stop here and um, happy to take questions and, and talk to you guys a little bit about about um, the subject thanks well I'm gonna start with one sure. is is where Mitchell the same person who wrote with whom is associated the yellow room yes Yes, so for those of you who know where Mitchell, where Mitchell was, so he, was, um, so he, he pioneered something called the rest cure, for those of you who know about this, and, and he used this to treat women who were suffering, primarily women who were suffering from something called neurasthenia. Neurasthenia is one of those pain things, right? It's not just that, but that's one of it is. And so um, he, um, he, he put a lot of upper middle class women in particular under the rest cure, basically involved almost complete isolation. Uh, they literally, the women who were undergoing the rescue were basically confined to their room, confined to their beds, basically, and were really not supposed to be moving. They were not really supposed to leave the room. So this happened to a woman named Charlotte Perkins Gilman, who underwent Silas Ware Mitchell's rescue, uh, and it nearly drove her literally crazy. 
Uh, and um, she subsequently wrote about it in a famous short story called um, The Yellow Wallpaper. Um, and uh, Charlotte Perkins Gilman was safe to say probably not a fan of Ware Mitchell, uh, <laughs> and probably safe to say she, she was also a art 19th century feminist, and probably safe to say that she's one of the sources for us who, declaring that Ware Mitchell probably wasn't, had some attitudes towards women which were backwards by the standard of the time as opposed to our standards, okay? <laughs> All right, so yes, absolutely. We had a, the a traveling exhibit on, uh, associated with the yellow wallpaper mm -hmm. a couple of years back, and I keep thinking the word where, mm -hmm. and then I'm going, okay. Mm -hmm. All right, so, uh, do we have some questions here? Hi. Hi. Uh, so you, it's my understanding, this may be incorrect, but that there's sort of this, uh, this uh, imaging fetish in, in many of the medical practices. I recently was reading about uh, um, other neurologists went to, and, and also sort of anthropologists went to figure out everything that happens when we have, when we think about this or that or whatever. Um, do you <laughs> and I think that's related in that there's, uh, there's this continued obsession of finding the lesion that it's, it's eventually somewhere. Do you think there will be a point at which we stop chasing the lesion, we all admit that there is no such thing, and go about it a different way? Probably not. <laughs> that would be my answer to your question. I'd like to think so, but you know, partly, I guess partly what my work is based about is again, these ideas are so sort of deeply rooted, right, in, in they're not, it's not just 19th century. I mean, history is a seamless web, but I sort of am 19th century American, so that's where I focus, right? Um, but, but these ideas, I think, are so deeply rooted. I, I think it's going to be really difficult to imagine, imagine a sort of culturally ever really dislodging ourselves from them almost completely. I think it would be great. I mean, that's one of the things I sort of, I mean, I'm a bioethicist as well, so that's one of the things I sort of urge is, is we ought we ought to do better, right? I mean, we ought to, one of the things I sort of suggest is that it's, it falls upon providers to help people understand that just because we can't see the lesion in their pain doesn't mean it's not real and that they're not experiencing it, right? I mean, th that's an important message, I think, and it, it can be done. So um, one of the interesting things is that part of the story is actually Freud, uh, this historical story, right? So Freud basically was really, really interested in neurology. He loved neurology, but, but they couldn't find those lesions. And Freud writes about this, and he, was, he got pretty frustrated with it. And that's actually part where the psychoanal psychoanalytic sort of the theories of psychoanalysis are actually born. The idea is that, well, we can, there are thoughts we can have and emotions we can have and feelings that we can have that can actually cause somatic pathology, right, even if we can't find the lesions. So, so this is where they came in. A lot of people think, a lot of historians who write about this say that, oh, well, we left the lesion stuff behind because then we have the psychoanalysts. And actually, partly what I'm interested in is ideas have a little bit more staying power than that, I think, right? I mean, I think... Psychological lesions. Right, psychological lesions, that's right. And that's exactly, I mean, that's... that's. And then, then you get, I mean, th those are predecessors to things like somatoform disorder or conversion disorder, which you find in the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual, right? Ways in which people's thoughts and emotions become converted, literally, right, into bodily pathologies, right? This is where this all comes from. So um, I think these ideas are still pretty powerful. Uh, so let me preface this by saying I'm a physical therapist, mm -hmm. but also a chronic pain patient, um, a patient with chronic pain. Um, <clears throat> I treat children, but I would, I would say that my colleagues who are very good at what they do in the world of pain, they're as best as they can be in the world of pain, um, are probably quite good at being able to tell you where your pain is coming from without that image, but because of the system in which we operate in, they're often, the patients often have imaging anyway. Um, so I think there's some, I think there is some hope. And, and what would, what do you think about, so current neuroscience, so one of my colleagues in PT does basic science research, um, and uh, in, in rodents right now, but looking at um, sensations of pain in areas where the legion is not. So, so a similar thing, is hers is a spinal cord injury model. Um, and so the nervous system is so distributed um, that the neuroscience of pain, might, the lesion might not be in a place. So, right. so I guess my thought of lesion is, it may be a lesion that's kind of just so distributed that you would never ever find it because it's how my system interprets sure. whatever that movement is or that sensation. Sure. Your thoughts. Right. That's very interesting. I mean, I think um, 
sort of a couple different things. I mean, I think, first of all, the idea that sort of well-trained professionals can find where it's hurting without the image, I mean, I think that's, that's, not, that's not a thought. We know that that's true. I mean, it's just absolutely true. The interesting thing is why we require medical imaging to substantiate it then, right? And I think that has something to do with this, right? Um, so I asked my father, who's a physician, why do we do so much medical imaging, Dad? And he says, well, because it pays well, yeah. right? But the problem is, as I say to him, well, that's not really an answer. That's a question. <laughs> Right? Why does it pay well? Right? And then there's a, there's some in, that takes us down to some interesting uh, sort of pathways as well. So I think um, the other idea that, that the, the lesions are so distributed that we may never find them, I mean, it's sort of, I, I have no idea, might very well be true, right? I mean, I sort of, I, I still think it's interesting because it's so important to find the lesion, right? I mean, it's just so important. And I mean, when you talk to, and again, I'm not a clinician, but I do talk to a lot of, of pain providers because of what my interest. And you know, part of my emphasis is, do we really need to understand the exact molecular etiology of pain in order to treat it better, right? And I think that most people say the answer is probably not, right? I mean, we don't really need to know exactly what's going on. I'm not saying we shouldn't. Right? But we don't really need to, to do a better job. Right? And so that's part of my interest is why is it so important to us to find the lesion. Right? It reminds me a little bit, your story reminds me a little bit of Benjamin Brody. Right? I mean, the, the lesion is there. It's just a question of where it is. I mean, she can be complaining in her toes or her pinky, whatever it is. It's there. It's somewhere in the body. And gosh darn it, he's going to find it. Right? I've wondered about one of the reasons for, for imaging being concerned about malpractice. Thank you. Do you um, we've talked a lot about treatment, but we haven't really talked a lot about cure. Do you think that a lot of patients are looking for this imagery to find something? Because when you find something, it kind of shows, oh, well, this is what is wrong, and this we can cure. Yeah. Do you think that chronic pain patients especially really search for something they can cure, and that's why they suggest imagery so often? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, there's, there's no question about it. I mean, there's, so there's a couple things going on there. First is, you know, chronic pain, uh, chronic, the relationship between chronic pain sufferers and their providers is pretty much the worst in American healthcare. I mean, uh, and, and that's actually been documented. I'm not just sort of saying that. I mean, that they've studied it. And by a, a number of different measures that the social scientists use, it's just terrible, right? It's terrible. So chronic pain sufferers are not, I'm, and I'm speaking again as a group, not all of them are like this, obviously, right? Individuals or people vary, but um, they're oftentimes angry. They're oftentimes desperate for a very, very understandable reasons, right? A lot of times they endure stigma and skepticism and doubt. So yeah, they want, they want not only do they want proof to be validated, but there's also hope that it can finally, that can finally be fixed, right? And then that's the other factor is what's going on today is, you know, the, the sort of the fix it mentality that characterizes American healthcare. It works very well for acute injuries, right? Where you have a broken arm, I go in and it gets set and then it's better. The problem is, is that we're a nation of chronically ill people uh, and chronic, chronic illness is chronic which means it doesn't really go away, right? And so the whole idea of curing chronic illness is troubling in its own right. It's sort of difficult to understand what that means. And so you see a lot of providers talking about we have to move to a, a, away from a cure model and towards a care model, but that's hard. I mean, that's hard when the, the, the sort of the culture in which we are situated, sort of thinking about illness and the body and health is one which, t which sort of tells us to strive for fixes and because people are in pain, understandably, right? I mean, they want it to go away. I don't, I don't blame them at all, you know? So I think part of it is, is definitely that. It's not just validation, but it's also hope that if we find the seat of the pain, then we can fix it. We can do a surgery. We can, we can do a, a nerve block. We can do something that will fix that exact spot. Thank you for such an interesting presentation. I'm Marie Picorni, and I direct the uh, PhD program in nursing. And one of our nursing students is doing a really interesting dissertation, and it fits what you're talking about. She's doing an intervention study uh, with patients that have phantom pain after an amputation. And she's doing something where she's teaching them to tap on that amputated limb as an adjuvant. And so it, it'll be interesting. You know, it's hard to recruit patients into it. It's taking her some time to do it. But that's very often, you know, what so many of us are looking for is what are the interve interventions that can be used to give people some relief. Right. So it'll be interesting to see uh, what she does find. Yeah, so no, that's thank very you. interesting. Thank yeah. you for telling me. I'd, I'd love to hear more about it. Um, okay, so. I have lots of things. We'll talk later. Um, and, uh, um, but one thing I wanted to talk about kind of in particular is, is there, I think there is a sort of trend towards the knowledge of pain being a cycle. Like people will talk about the cycle of pain and there's talk about things like fibromyalgia where there is no 
source, exactly. Um, but it's still not really, I mean, it's accepted, but it's not accepted. And like, how does that fit into all of this? Do you think there's a change in culture or is it just because we can sell pills for fibromyalgia now? Or <laughs> um, the last one is a good point, okay? So have, we haven't talked much about that at all. Um, well, so yeah, I mean, I don't think it's, I, I wouldn't go so far as to say it's more accepted, right? I mean, I mean, you know, fibromyalgia is definitely a contested illness. Uh, it is now, it is, a, it is a diagnosis for which providers can be reimbursed. That's, there, that's something, because it wasn't 10 years ago, right? Uh, it is now, so what I call that progress. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe I guess right. Uh, I think I, I, but I think it's still I think it's still contested. I think there's still a lot of um, uh, doubt and skepticism, even though it is it has now sort of achieved a diagnosis, right? So so I I, I don't I don't know that it marks an important sort of cultural shift in, in how we would view um, that kind of pain. Uh, it's difficult to diagnose. It's sort of a diagnosis of exclusion. It's not this that or the other, and it's got these things. So maybe it's fibromyalgia. And then yeah, I mean I sort of to your last point, yeah, I mean. I do think that the availability of drugs that people can prescribe has something to do. I mean, we know we know that that matters. I mean, that that's not sort of, you know, when we study sort of the literature on motivated bias, it's very very clear that the existence of pharmaceutical agents that we can use has a lot to do with diagnosis. It has a lot to do with reimbursement. Uh, it has a lot to do with prescription itself, right? I mean, supply drives use. We have the drugs. Pharmaceutical companies are very good marketers, and I don't mean that as a criticism in this context, right? I mean, they're very good at getting people to use their products. That's what they do, right? Uh, and so that's what happens. So yeah, I think you know, the combination of, um, I don't know if it's a combination of anything, but I mean, I think the, um, I, I think probably, and, and then also patient advocacy as well. That's probably the other thing, right? I mean, you know, so, so patients are starting to get a little bit more at, uh, organized, um, especially chronic pain sufferers who deal with a lot of things that you know, are difficult to deal with, right? So fibromyalgia groups were pretty well organized and, 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 and probably politically that had something to do with the, the validation of the diagnosis. It seems that we've talked a lot about not being able to find lesions, um, not being able to find sources of pain. So it seems that we're maybe moving more towards, um, I guess maybe an acceptance of there being a very significant amount of pain that we just can't find a source for. So as we move in that direction, um, I guess how is medical practice going to move with it? Like what is the, what is the next step if it becomes more widely accepted that uh, there is no source for certain types of pain? Wow, that's a great question. Um, um, okay, so first thing, first I would, I would wanna push back a little bit on the empirical claim, right? I, I don't know how fast we're moving to that. I mean, there's the idea of what I call pretty pictures of brains that was referenced in the first question. That's the holy grail now. Ah, we can find, we'll look in the brain, we'll hook them up to the fMRI scanner and look in there and then their brains will light up and we can find objective evidence of pain. Well, he just gives them a pain pill. He just gives them a pain pill. Another prescription. Right, well, yeah, that, that's, so, so, I mean, so, so, that's true actually, that's a good point. I mean, I guess, I guess, so what I'd say, the, 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 the back to the, the, the sort of the first idea, I'm not so sure how well it's being accepted. Uh, I, I think I think these ideas, and this is sort of what I'm getting at. These ideas, I think, are still they are still with us in a very, very important sense. I think they still drive a lot of how we conceptualize the body in, in illness, not just by providers, but by by patients too, right? So, but let, let's say that that does happen, right? Let's say we do get to that point. I hope we do, right? Um, what would happen? What would the world look like, right? I mean, well, I think um, it would be a world in which we'd probably see less emphasis on medical imaging. Uh, it would be a world in which we understand that we have the tools to treat pain better than we do, even if we don't fully understand the etiology of it. It would be a world in which we sort of dislodge ourselves from the need to discover the source of the pain in order to treat it well. We know that we don't need to, and we know that it's not as crucial as we might think. I'm not opposed, to, by the way, to trying to figure out the etiology of pain. I mean, thousand flowers bloom, the, the life scientists want to do that research, great. They, I, they absolutely should. I shouldn't, there's no reason to stop them, right? I mean, I think it's great. But we don't need to wait for the holy grail, which is what we've been talking about now for 150 years of, oh, there's the lesion in order to do a better job. And I think that that's what a world like that would look like, where we're sort of not waiting. We, we know we have the tools and the capacity to do better, uh, and we don't need to find the lesions in order to do it. So do you know what a better job would look like? <laughs> yes, I do actually. A better job would be one in which we have less absolute, we have, we have two things. This is what I sort of look for. One is less lower prevalence and incidence of pain across the population. 
right? We can actually document that less people are experiencing persistent pain. Because if less people are experiencing persistent pain, we're probably doing something to make pain um, less a part of their lives, okay? So that's a, sort of a, a good indicator that we're probably doing a better job across the population. And then the second thing that would look better is if um, we had a little bit less inequalities in the distribution of pain, okay? So we're not treating different people differently uh, in how we regard their pain. And then sort of related to that is also a reduction in stigma. Right, so we need to know how much stigma we have, which we don't know yet, okay? Um, but, but, but once we did that, then if we could document that there's less stigma as opposed to more stigma, then I think that would be better as well. That's one of the ways we know we're doing better. I think, in, I mean, the vast majority of patients, is this, I don't think this thing even does anything. But, uh, in, in the vast majority of patients, the, the pain is, is able to be found and uh, that's not been the case before modern imaging. I mean, a lot of it's obvious on a physical exam, but I mean, the MRI scan is just such a revolutionary technology in finding pain that we might have previously written off as, as uh, not real and treated in a different way. But, uh, so I think, I mean, the, the folks that you're talking about in, in practice is a very, fortunately, I think, is a very small subset of, of the population. Uh, I mean, that's your concentration. And uh, I mean, most, most physicians I know that uh, have a patient, they can't find the pain, they'll, they, you know, they'll do an MRI, something they can pretty much almost rule out, you know, with, with fairly high certainty that there's not a, a tumor there or some sure. uh, thing that needs to be intervened upon. Uh, so well, that, that's, that's just my point. Okay, I think that's good. I mean, I think, I mean, I guess, I guess and we can talk a little bit more after me. I guess what I would say is, I mean, does medical imaging work? Well, it depends on what you mean by work, right? I mean, there's some things, I mean, the answer is always it depends, right? I mean, there's some kinds of pain, for example, pain, as you said, that sort of appears in the presence, there's a suspicion of a solid tumor. Well, MRI imaging is going, MRI is going to be crucial for that, right? I mean, obviously you have to do that, but I mean, the, the evidence that I'm aware of, and again, I'm not a clinician, right? But the evidence that I'm aware of suggests that with other kinds of sort of not like non-specific low back pain, the medical imaging doesn't at least translate into better outcomes, um, which isn't to say that clinicians might not find it to be useful. Um, I wouldn't offer an opinion on that, right? I think, and I think the back is an entirely <laughs> segment unto its own. Right. As, as someone who used to treat backs, uh, you can have somebody who has a completely, and, and MRI scans and bone scans are, are very sensitive. You can have, the, the scans are completely normal, yet they're incapacitated by the pain. Right. And on the other hand, you can have people who have a complete spinal stenotic block in their spine and facet arthropathy and huge herniated discs. And they do not hurt right. at all. Right. And right. and it's a hard thing so to do. Right. So yeah, it's, yeah. It's, it's logic doesn't does not always. I think that's right. So apply. I mean, you know, is the imaging useful? Again, it depends on what kind of pain we're talking about, what part of the body we are, right? I mean, where are we looking? So I mean, I think. Um, Again, the evidence I, I'm aware of suggests that for most kinds of chronic pain, the amount of imaging we do doesn't translate into better outcomes. That's the evidence I'm aware of. So. Um, Again, I'm not a clinician, so maybe I'm wrong about that. But that's that's what that that's my reading of what the literature tends to suggest. And the clini clinicians don't want to miss something that is treatable. Right. And uh, and so, yes, self referral is probably an issue. Right. So uh, then that's when, that's, a, when that's, a, that's, a, that's 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 a whole different thing, right? The fear yeah. of missing things in general, which most people think is one of the major drivers of utilization of imaging to begin with, right? The fear that well, we ha we want to be able to rule it out, we don't want to be able to miss it. So let's go ahead and do the imaging procedure so that we we at least sort of find something if it's there and there's and the malpractice situation weighs right. in on that as well so that's the that's, that's that's the next talk <laughs> oh i was just going to follow up on trey's comment about what would the future look like so i think that i and my colleagues um in the physical therapy field would say that um, we talk much more now about management of pain not about cure treatment making it go away um and management of pain and that it is not a single provider issue pain tends to not get solved when there's one provider trying to deal with it because right. there's so many aspects it's a, such a personal thing right and and so I as a PT cannot prescribe if some medications are indeed a part of this mm -hmm. particular person's sure. calming of their system then I need the physician sure. um, 
if some mechanical or other um, means and exercise might help, then my services might come in. So, right. so a team approach sure. and managing it, not sure. fixing it, right. not curing it. Right. Yeah, I think that's exactly right. I mean, um, I mean, any any handbook on pain on pain and pain management, when you open it up, the first page, the second page, it has to be multimodal, and it has to be multidisciplinary. Um, the real question is that the structures of healthcare services that we have in the United States are not designed to facilitate that. So, so there's some efforts to change that. How successful that will be remains to be seen, right? So that's sort of another question: is why have we set it up so bizarrely, right? I mean, to be honest with you, right? I mean, that's not. Um, it's, it's difficult to find that kind of, of team-based continuity of care that's really required to, 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 and that the evidence suggests would be better for, for helping people with pain, I think. I have a question. In China or other places which make a lot of use of acupuncture and such, and the cultures may be so different that you can't compare them or the statistics may not exist, but is there any indication whether acupuncture, I mean, obviously if I'm missing a leg, you can't put a needle in the middle of the air, but is there is there any bit any correlation there or any? I well, I I mean I I think the cultures probably are too different to compare, right? I mean you know from what I know, which is very little, right? Is that when they compare acupuncture to placebo, it barely beats placebo, but placebo pathways for pain are very powerful, right? I mean you know people who get placebos for pain consistently report you know 50% of them report getting substantial relief. Um, so for lots of things, placebos are a standard for ineffective treatment, which I understand. Mm -hmm. I mean, if, you have, if you're looking for a tumor shrinkage and a placebo doesn't shrink the tumor, that's probably a good standard for evaluating how effective a particular medication is. But for pain, it's not a good standard for evaluation because it actually helps a lot, right? I mean, it's not, you know, it's actually pretty good. So, I mean, I don't know, does acupuncture help? It seems to. It doesn't really be placebo, but placebo seems to help a lot. People feel better. So again, I'm not a clinician. I wouldn't know. But there is actually a lot of very interesting stuff, historical literature on acupuncture in late 19th century America, actually. Uh, when acupuncture really started to become, there was sort of, it became popular in the mid to late 19th century in the US. And you start to see lots of advertisements for acupuncture and pain about this time. So it's something I actually want to look into. Anybody else? Well, then, thank you very much. Thank Dr. you, guys. Bob.